Hello and welcome to this talk on the Apex Roadmap on what's new and what's coming. I am Daniel Bellinger, Product Manager for Apex and joining me today is... Chris Peterson, Senior Director of Product Management for Apex mostly, but also general developer experience. So you all have seen this slide never before in your life, I'm sure. You should make any and all purchasing decisions based on generally available functionality and you know the rest of it. Right, so today we're going to cover four key areas plus go over the roadmap in general. First, we're going to go over what's new and improved for enforcing security in your Apex code. Then we'll talk about the improvements we're making for async processing, mostly around curables. We'll look at what we're doing for quality of life improvements for developers. These are things like your idea exchange ideas. Then we'll look at data processing and how you can make more out of your Apex code. And then we'll do a quick recap of where the roadmap's going for Apex. So first, Chris, can you take us through security, please? Of course, it's like all I've been talking about for the last few Dreamforce and TDXs. So hopefully you're all familiar with user mode database operations in Apex at this point. If you are not, they let you take the traditional ugly mess of describe calls that frankly I found embarrassing that we see on the top of the code here and turn it into what we have on the bottom. 96% less security code if I want to cherry pick some great statistics. User mode is now generally available. It is fully supported for the App Exchange security review now. Although I will note that the checkmark scanner has not been updated. So if it dings you on this, you're okay. Put it in your false positive document. They have promised me they will have that done in the first half of next year at the absolute latest. But it is fully approved for App Exchange use. You are ready to go. For the sake of time, we're not showing you all the forms of user mode, but it is available for DML, SOCL, SOCL, every database operation as a keyword, as a method, et cetera, every permutation of it. Everywhere you touch the database, you can now use user mode to have Apex actually leave system mode, de-escalate down to the true user permissions for that database operation, and then return back to system mode to, in the Apex runtime afterwards. You can mix and match user mode and system mode in the same context. You can put them in adjacent lines of code if you so want. There's pretty much no limit. All the edge cases work right. That's why it took us so long to do it. Okay. So we've also heard some feedback that that isn't good enough. There's something in the middle between user mode and system mode that you would like us to support. And so we've been playing with that idea and we've come up with a developer preview that is decidedly not the final form of this feature. There's definitely some things we need to refine in terms of how it works with packages and the security model thereof, but we wanted to get some actual tangible feedback and get it into your hands for that. So we're launching a dev preview in winter 24 for user mode plus a permission set escalation. What does this mean? Well, with the code on screen, again, placeholder syntax for the dev preview, you can define your own access level, which is the enum that you pass into database operations when using user mode database operations. And here we've said user mode plus a permission set. What that does is creates, it applies the permission set for that specific database operation. The user does not need to have that permission set assigned because you are an Apex in trusted code. We assume that the escalation you are doing, which is already less than full system mode, is something that is appropriate and approved. So we're trying to give you more flexibility but the ability to constrain the security model down to what makes sense for you. So if you have a security bug, an injection attack, the implications are less dire. But also, by using permission sets, admins can look at the permissions that you are escalating with and have a better understanding of what your application does, particularly for ISVs. While we were at it, we figured if we're gonna put it in the middle ground, we should do it for strip and accessible as well because we've seen a lot of people who manually copy fields from the input to the output after the strip and accessible operation for things like fields that are calculated that are critical for uh, data integrity. So something like a declarative rollup or something like that. So we're trying to support the complexities of real world use cases where you have multiple use cases and needs from different UI clients and things like that that all hit one Apex controller. Take a look at it, enable it with the scratch work feature, user mode, Apex user mode with perm set, scan the QR code, it'll take you to a Trailblazer community group where you can give us feedback that we desperately, desperately want, especially from ISV partners. 
Great, thanks Chris. So now let's change and look at where we're going with queuable processing for asynchronous jobs. We've done a number of improvements recently to queuable jobs. We've had the depth control, which can help you contr prevent runaway jobs. We've had, um, I'm gonna draw a blank. Depth control and uh, deduplication control. Yeah, we've got the deduplication control, which is new and winter 24. Finalizers? Sorry? Are you thinking of finalizers? We do transaction files. Anyway, we'll go we'll carry on with this. So when you have inbound queuable jobs, there can be a, a degree of um, inbound sources. They could be coming from trigger recursion. They could be coming from platform events. They could be coming from a user enthusiastically pressing a button which doesn't get disabled in the UI. And so when that user presses the button and they enqueue a job, we've added a new feature in Winter 24 called a deduplication signature. And you build up a unique signature to represent that job. In this case, it's a string and an ID. You could also use a combination of integers. And you build that signature up and you enqueue the job with that. And the first job that goes in will go in as normal. But then, if the user clicks again, the same code will run, build the same deduplication signature. But in that case, the signatures will match. And you'll actually get an exception back that says duplicate message exception. And that new job won't go into the queue while the other one's waiting to be run. And no matter how many times they press that button within that same condition, that subsequent jobs will be rejected. Why is this beneficial for you? There's a couple of reasons. If those duplicate jobs were to run, they're likely to run into contention issues and locking around trying to update the same records in the same fields, or making callouts to the same external services. Additionally, those async Apex jobs are part of a daily limit for your org. So you're basically doing processing for something that's already going to happen. So we'll try and avoid double billing you on that sort of scenario. Another area that we're looking forward to in the future to enhance queuable jobs is the concept of a cursor. And it's probably easiest if we work through this as an example. So you could take a what would usually look like a normal dynamic SQL statement and run it and instead get a cursor back which will store in the state of this queuable. That cursor is fully serializable, which means it will go through the state of the, it'll, it'll persist through the execution of that queuable in this scenario. And then the interesting stuff actually happens when that queuable runs. So on execution, the queuable job can go to the cursor and fetch a subset of records from the overall SQL query results set. So Daniel, I'm sure this is using offset under the hood. We have a maximum of 2,000 records, right? No, it's not. And that's one of the key features of this. Yeah, obviously, as Chris says, if you were using offset traditionally to try and do something like this, you'd run into the limit of 2,000. It's quite restricted. This, you can go through the entire SQL results set. So it makes it ideal for scenarios like a page controller, where you might have the user jumping back and forward between a large volume of records. Um, yeah. So, once you've got your results, obviously you can process them and then you can make a decision like, are there more records I need to produce, process, checking against the overall size of the query result. If there are, you can just pass them on to the subsequent cursor, a uh, subsequent queuable, and it will pick up and you can track the position and start processing from there. It's also really powerful for other scenarios, as I mentioned, page controllers, or you could potentially use it to parallelize the processing of a job by chunking the records between different jobs. So let's change directions again to talk about some of the things we're delivering from that have come from you, our developers, via the idea exchange. One of the really common ones um, in a scenario that you might have come across is you have a list of S objects. You couldn't, it's in memory. You couldn't sort it through SQL. You need to sort it by a particular field, say the number of employees here. How would you do that today? Um, you would have to implement a comparable wrapper. You would have to take each account from that thing and re from the initial list and repack it into a new list in that wrapper and then sort the wrapped list. It's a lot of work just to sort a list. So in Winter 24, we're um, providing the comparator interface. By implementing that, and this is an example here where I may have made an S object comparator that uses that new interface, we can actually separate the sorting of the list from the thing in the list that you're trying to sort. It makes your life a whole lot easier because you can adjust the sorting really easily. In this case, you can sort by an arbitrary field on S object without having to implement a new comparator. Um, the example code for that comparator is in that QR code. 
My favorite part about this, if you want to do this on hard mode, your collection does not all have to be the same type. You can, in theory, support sorting mixed types in the same collection. So if you have multiple S objects in a mixed collection, you can have the same comparator as long as it understood the collection contents, sort them all collectively. Great, yes. All right, Chris, do you want yes. to talk about null coloessing, please? Yeah, i.e. the second half of safe navigation that we didn't finish until now. So hopefully you all know and love the safe navigation operator that we introduced a couple of years back at this point. This is part of the spec we originally built up, but we didn't have time to finish it. So we came back to it now and it is now GA in spring 24. It is a simple and easy way of applying a default when you're working with nulls is the simplest way I can describe it. In my head, I read it as if null, use default value on right. That's exactly what it does. So by using the double question mark operator, if the left operand evaluates to null, the right operand will be substituted instead. So as we see here, page title would be default title because supplied title is null. Given that 13% of all unhandled Apex exceptions in production are null pointer exceptions, we figured you could use yet another tool to make dealing with nulls just a little bit easier as a nice quality of life improvement. I'll do it. Thank you. So here's an example. We run a SOC query, and then we're trying to count the number of times that the billing city is equal to San Francisco. But if billing city is null, we get back a literal null in our JSON, which may not be compliant with the schema we've told our clients about. So yeah, we could add an if statement in there and handle that fallback. This isn't hard, but it's ugly. I got it. And I think this looks a lot better. So with the null coalescing operator, all we have to do is just double question mark zero and make sure that no matter what, we give back a number. I'm sure you'll come up with more creative and more advanced use cases, but hopefully it makes your life just a little bit simpler. Great. And now let's look at what we're doing for data processing in Apex. Data Weave in Apex is a new feature that's now GA in Winter 24. For those of you who don't know, Data Weave is MuleSoft's language to read, transform, and write data from one format to another. And it does that as a functional language. So it's very concise and accurate in the way it does that. So to use Data Weave in Apex, you can load your Data Weave scripts into the org and then you can reference them directly from Apex, pass them in the payload, and have the results come back straight to your Apex. In this example here, we're taking a CSV file and directly mapping it into contact objects. Why that's really powerful for an Apex developer is it means you can focus more on the, the business processes and the needs of that data rather than getting the data into the format that you need to process it. So that's, yeah, available winter 24. So Daniel, five people came up to me on Tuesday when I did this session and asked me, which MuleSoft SKUs do I need to purchase to enable this feature? Happily, I can say you do not need to buy any SKUs. It's free wherever you've got currently Apex, Apex today. Yep. And I'm sure it doesn't support packaging. There's gotta be a lot of gotchas, right? We have considered the packaging scenarios with your scripts. You can mark them as global or public, depending on how you want to expose them to your subscriber orgs. So all those bases are covered. And App Exchange Security, we're good to go, right? Yes, yep, all ready to run through that. Yep, all approved. So ready to be adopted. Another area we're looking to make data processing in Apex easier is zip support. You may have had a scenario like this or similar with maybe some somebody sending you a file. In this case, we're making a call out to an external service to do some translations that we need for the page we're gonna show. And that, external service happily returns the results of the translations to us in a zip file. It's not a big zip file, but now we've got a problem of how are we going to get those translations out of that data. Historically, you might have been able to use something like ZipX. It has a number of limitations, particularly around its amount of heap and CPU it uses to try and do that actual extraction. So in Spring 24, we're going to introduce a developer preview of native zip support in Apex. It's going to take the form of a reader class and a writer class. So you can see here, the reader class is directly taking the blob that came back from that web service call out. And because we know where the translation will exist, we can go straight to that zip entry, extract the blob data, and then turn that straight into JSON. You'll also be able to iterate over the contents of that zip. So you find other zip entries. 
and it will have a corresponding zip writer. And a personal plea, if you are using ZipX, please switch over. ZipX has, does some interesting things with memory allocation rates that aren't great for our systems and cause more garbage collection than we really like to happen. So please migrate over. This is way faster, way easier on limits, and just objectively better for everybody involved. Consider it a personal favor. Yeah, I should point out it is still part of your Apex transaction, so we will enforce heap and CPU limits. So yeah, you still need to. This doesn't make it. Apex good at processing binary files. It just makes it less bad. Yeah. So if you are dealing with zip files that are more than a couple of megabytes, Apex is still the wrong tool for you. But if you were desperate enough to adopt ZipX with all of its constraints, we want to give you better tools that hurt our systems less and hurt your heads less. Great, thanks. Chris, do you want to take us through formulas? Absolutely. So this is one of our, a passion project and one of the engineers on the Apex team. We are working on formula evaluation in Apex, targeting a Spring 24 dev preview. So what are we thinking? We're thinking admins already know and love formulas and users already mostly know and love them. So let's let you evaluate formulas at runtime in Apex. Pass it an Apex object or an S object to evaluate the formula against. So that first part is brand new. You cannot run formulas against Apex objects anywhere other than kinda sorta in flow today. It opens a lot of interesting doors, but we wanna get you out of the business of building your own rules engines and adopting one that everybody hopefully already knows. We think this is gonna be really useful for things like trigger execution frameworks, where you can then define a formula to control whether a trigger executes or not, instead of a simple Boolean or something like that. In advanced use cases, you may need validation rules that are specific to a single product in your organization that has special terms attached to it. Well, now you can. You can take the formula string from an object and evaluate it in Apex. No longer are you limited to predefined formulas that were built into a formula field or et cetera. So this is what we think it'll look like. Note that it is not finalized syntax, but roughly. With the compile formula method, you pass in a formula and you tell us what its input and its return type is. You can get back a formula object that you can evaluate any number of times passing in those arguments. And it's really that simple. Okay. Great, thanks Chris. So Double -click. Let's, let's go over the Apex roadmap. We've pretty much covered these four key areas. So we've got the deduplication control and the depth control and the time delay, which was the part I forgot about curables before. We've got our dev preview for user mode with permission sets. We'd love your feedback on that. All this is coming in Winter 24. Additionally, the, with the comparator, there is also a collator class for doing locale based sorting based on the current user. That's a implementation we provided for you. And as we talked about coming soon, obviously we've got all our Einstein for Developers work for you, which has been covered in other sessions and also the booths if you're interested in that. Come to the developer keynote at 1.30 and you'll see a demo. Yep. Please come to the developer keynote, 1.30, third floor. Yeah. We've talked about our zip support and the null coalescing operator. We also have some other nice features coming for developers. We have a native UUID class, so it can generate unique identifiers for you and parse them and represent them as a system built-in type. And then there was also got the concept of after making a save point and rolling it back and invalidating it, you'd be able to make callouts. That's for specific scenarios where you might want to actually do something after that rollback occurred. And then looking further forward, this is the complete roadmap. So we've got what are we doing for user mode with permission sets based on your feedback will help shape that feature. The concept of being able to do post install script testing directly in Apex. The further queuable enhancements is primarily the cursor work we're working on. As Chris mentioned, formula eval in Apex. And yes, generics is still there. Yes, we're still looking for your feedback on the scenarios you want to be able to work with that. And you may have noticed we need generics ourselves now for the formula API we just showed you on the last slide. So for that feedback, um, ideally there's a QR code there that will take you to the forums that will have links for all the resources you need, including all the ones there on the other side. If any of those you want to provide us feedbacks on the sort of scenarios you'd like to work through with those or how, how we should shape them, it's always valuable to us. And you can always drop us an email with any other feedback that's not appropriate for a public forum. And with that, say thank you for coming. <laughs>